welcome to Durham. Thank Duke. you. Um, speaking of birthdays, would you mind if we belatedly wished you happy birthday? Uh, I believe your birthday was last Friday. <laughs> Very okay. kind of you. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Yeah. 81. Yeah. And today is uh, Fela Kuti's birthday. So it's, uh, I don't know if I can stand all this convergence. Uh, I just may, I may roast. Um, I thought, I was thinking about uh, this. Uh, comment you made about um, when you were starting out in, in, in Cape Town. And um, you, of course, you'd heard, you'd, you'd heard Duke, Duke Ellington's music, and, and you were playing. And people kept saying that you sounded like Thelonious Monk. And you had, hadn't heard Monk at that point. And so you went to hear, to listen to Monk. And you say that you, you loved it. Um, and you said, because it, it, it was traditional African music. Thelonious Monk is traditional African music. And um, I wonder if you could talk about that and the reception of African American music, uh, Monk, and more generally, uh, AMA, you know, gospel, et cetera, et cetera, D uh, uh, Duke, um, and its relationship to uh, traditional South African music that you, know, you were familiar with, that you've grown up listening to, were performing yourself. Well, <laughs> um, growing up in South Africa, Ellington was not a an American musician for us. He was just the wise old man in the village. Uh, And Monk, similarly, the, what resonates with us, especially with Monk's music, is the, the simplicity, but the profundity of the simplicity. We, uh, we realize that children love monks' music. Perhaps because it's so direct. A um, friend of ours in Copenhagen, Max Brohl, who died a few years ago, baritone player and an arch architect. And these kids used to sing, well, 10, 12, 11, 12 years of age, they used to sing monks' music, you know, washing dishes and solos included. <laughs> um, when I first met Monk, I introduced myself and I thanked him for the inspiration that he gave me as a musician. He looked very quizzical at me and walked to the other end of the room, came back and walked back and forth and then came to me and said to me, you were the first piano player to tell me this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we then realized also that he was not very well accepted you know, even in jazz circles. And I then uh, spoke to several jazz pianists. It was always this very negative, <laughs> very negative uh, comments on Monk that he couldn't play, couldn't play a scale. You know, uh, But the music is so complex and it's so simple and the execution with the solos in, in jazz we say is in the pocket no matter how complex the 
the runnies or whatever he's always in the pocket right? um, yeah, Ellington Ellington first and on, on the other hand was uh, uh, one way or other you cannot escape Ellington in contemporary music like with Ornette also yeah, it touched all of us. Yeah. yeah. One thing I was drawn to in your comments about Monk um, in something I read uh, was you talked about his use of space and you related it to, to breath and you went on to, to talk more generally and to say that uh, uh, basically the breath is the essence of music breath and you connected it to memory, breath and memory. And um, it was a short interview and you didn't elaborate on it there. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate on it here. Um, I'm also wondering if it is, um, if that kind of observation and your practice of music and, and other things uh, is related to uh, this Japanese practice of Budo that you've been involved in for decades? Yeah, uh, <laughs> Budo is the Japanese uh, expression. Sometimes it, it is translated as martial arts, which is totally wrong. It has nothing to do with fighting. The, the Japanese calligraphy, Budo, actually means to stop fighting or no fighting and it's the principle of challenging the self. Uh, we understand that unless we know ourselves that we really cannot understand what our relationship is to each other and to the universe. So Buddha is the concept of, of understanding the self. I, uh, I came in yesterday from Tokyo and um, Kyoto and Tokyo, I did some studies with my teacher. I've been studying with him for 50 years. And then in Kyoto, I played two nights at uh, the Kamigamo Shinto Shrine, which is a, a national heritage. Uh, this is the fifth time I play in the in the shrine, I, one of the, I was actually the first musician to play in the shrine. This year, uh, I played two concerts and with a, um, with the monks opening the concert ceremony. The that shrine must be over 800, 900 years old. And every 21 years, they renovate the shrine. So I was asked to, to do this concert. It's a very unique uh, <coughs> group of people in Kyoto. They call themselves Lush Life Family. They're just jazz lovers. <laughs> Uh, so they do these concerts uh, uh, for uh, <coughs> they're all volunteers. Uh, the owner of this uh, of this little jazz club, and he's the one who organizes these concerts, gave me a book the day before yesterday, and he's been working on this for about thirty years. Uh, he's a photographer. The concept of the book is that uh, 
his photography. What he does, he goes out at night on his bicycle in Kyoto and takes photographs of uh, mostly uh, garbage, junk. That's quite amazing what he what he sees and what he photographs. The principle is that those images or let me put it this way, the garbage or the trash has no inherent ego. And so this is the principle that we we try to play the music. And in our lives, we practice Buddha, because we're always breaking down of the ego. So, so he has been, he's managed to do this. So, and also his friend is a, is a monk. So there's this uh, integral uh, principle that we, that we understand and understood through the music. Uh, it's continuous repetition of basics, mm. means of purification, so that we get rid of, we not get rid of, the, we can overcome that basic, basic ego. The, and so the principle of the principle of Buddha is actually the way that we, that we play, we play the music. The improvisation. So, uh, we regard ourselves as uh, the first uh, cyberspace uh, people because we have the same information that everybody else has. Like classical museums, only what we did, we put them in sound bites so we can access it very, very quickly. You know, by, uh, a, a piece at breakneck speed, you still can't think about it. Uh, so we, we don't see anything in separation with ourselves or the universe or the music. Buddha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, uh, one of, one of the most recent of your uh, releases, the song is My Story. Uh, yeah. uh, is it the most recent? Or? Yeah. yeah. Um, highly recommended, by the way. Um, it comes with a, a CD, but it also comes with a, a DVD with uh, you talking. And um, one of the things that struck me in watching it is that, uh, in talking about two or three of your compositions, um, you, ref you, you, your account of them was that they came to you um, in a dream or a, in a vision. Uh, I think you were talking about a piece called Aspen, and three people appeared to you, and there was another one in which you dreamt someone took you to a piano and uh, uh, showed you something and said, uh, play that or write that. Um, so I'm wondering, um, how typical is that of your composition process? Do you often um, receive music in this way, in that way? Dream, vision, kind of trance? Hmm. Uh, the Aborigine people have a, a, a concept they call a dream time. Yep. Also, yeah. in uh, South Africa, my uh, great grandfather was a, a chief stable boy for the first Afrikaner mm -hmm. president, <laughs> Paul Kruger, and introduced us to, you know, I suppose, for practice. We have a project in, in South Africa 
a few years ago we, we purchased a farm, a farm is about 800 hectare, and we're creating a, a project there, we call the project M7, which is music, movement, medicine, just an idea to put what we do on a daily basis, instead of separating it, but putting it all together. The, we do a lot of uh, work with the, with the sand people, the so-called Bushman people. Okay. We've been, my great-grandmother, my grandmother's uh, family people. But we have created this project, uh, especially for, for young musicians, because the, there's a severance between what we are and what we think we are. <laughs> so we call the project uh, Ancient Traditions, New Relevance. We do a lot of work with the, with, and with the Bushman, Bushman people. And the principle is the concept of what and who we are. Um, we asked one of the, the elders, the Bushman elders, I said to him, uh, you, we humanity, we, we are lost. We, we need water and wisdom. He said, uh, the, in the infinite, there is always a conflict planets, stars, but it has to be like this because this is the order. And God placed us on earth here to maintain this order and it, it takes a long time to maintain this order and there's a lot of suffering and conflict involved to maintain this order. But Eventually, humanity will have to accept it. And he says, you, like me, we were given the task to tell people about this order, whether they laugh at us or whether they push us aside. And wherever you are, you are, I'm holding your hand. You're my brother. And he said to me, well, the first thing I have to do is to learn the, the Bushman dance step. The, where our farm is, we are right in the heart. In fact, about two hours drive from where we are, they have created the SKA project. This uh, radio telescope that looks into the universe. Because that part of the world is one of the most stablest in the world. So we have this project that we we have an ancient tradition for the Bushmen, and we have a new technology to gaze into the stars and the universe. I think this year they have uh, graduated about 170 young astrophysicists. Right? So we see this this balance and understanding of. You know, ancient tradition and new relevance. The, and of course, we call it transmission. How do you, how do you pass on knowledge? The concept that we have is called transmission, which is but T R A N C E, transmission. And in trans dance, we have we find the synergy now. For example, with with Buddha, the, uh, you think you're familiar with uh, with Qigong. Qigong, Chinese uh, concept of 
internal energy, which is really when you study when you study Buddha, well, this is uh, the ultimate how to understand this internal energy. So, uh, working with our people in, in Japan, working with our people in uh, in, um, in the Kalahari, and also working in the United States here with one of our practitioners. Uh, from Harlem, Musawir, is Taiji, Taiji, Namsta. The principle of uh, or ki or chi uh, originates in what's called the Dantian or the lower, the lower abdomen. This is where the, the power is emanates from. In calligraphy, the Chinese Japanese calligraphy, the the the, the, the symbol is a fire with a pot of rice cooking, and the energy is the steam that emanates from it. And this energy, it's, uh, uh, develop or created in this part of the part of the body. When we <laughs> when we speak to, to the Bushman people, they say the same thing, but we are the same, they call it nun, which is this energy that they use in trans times. So we find this energy, uh, ancient tradition, with no relevance, no matter where we are in the world. And it is this uh, concept of so-called jazz music that has brought all of this together. Uh, sometimes we we do not realize how far and deep the music has really affected us. <laughs> I um, trans. Yes. I wanted to ask you about your. Um, I mean, you 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 presented music in so many different formats, uh, solo and trio, um, uh, large group orchestras, etc. Um, but you, you've also done a lot of duos, which kind of relating to what you were just talking about seems a particularly intense kind of musical encounter where certain kinds of uh, almost telepathic uh, interactions can take place. And I was um, interested to hear you talk a bit about, uh, about the musicians that you've done uh, duo dates with. Uh, Archie Shep was one of them. Gato Barbieri, uh, Max Roach. Uh, I especially want to get. I especially want to hear you. What, what you have to say about uh, Johnny Diotti, the bass player. Um, as I was telling you back uh, before we came in here, um, I first encountered his music on, on, on that album with you, uh, "Good News from Africa," that duo album. Um, I, I was in Munich, summer of '75, and back in the days of vinyl. And, um, and record stores actually had turntables where you could play the, play the music and um, sample them, uh, see, what you're, see what you're buying. And, and I saw this, this album and I, I put it on and listened to it. And I, I was just kind of transfixed and transformed. And I uh, was in Munich for a week or so and people were trying to, you know, don't you want to you know, go to the, these various tourist sites? You know? Don't you want to see the, the Olympic Village? You know, don't, don't, don't you want to go see, uh, who's, the, who's the mad, who's the mad uh, king in Bavaria? Uh, Ludwig, was it? Yeah. Don't you want to go see the Ludwig's castle? I, I just kept going back to that record store <laughs> to, to, to listen to good news from Africa. And, and that's what introduced me to Johnny Gianni's music. And I went out and you know, uh, found various dates that he'd done as a leader. Um, and you know, work, working with the Danish musician, uh, Pierre uh, Dorge and stuff. 
Um, so, uh, what was he like? You know, we we played the, uh, different formats, as you say, solo, trio, <coughs> duo, um, Akaya, seven piece, big band, uh, philharmonic, philharmonic orchestras, uh, choirs. <laughs> they once asked Ellington, they said, Do, how do you manage to keep all these great musicians together? Any Hodges, Russell Prokop, uh, how do you do it? And Duke said, uh, I found a gimmick. I give them money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's a question of money. <laughs> Here we have, a, we have an idea that we would like to, to, to work with a big band or it's uh, sometimes not uh, not possible, and then also the industry is a very strange animal. <laughs> I, was, I was just telling him, the, what is this? Is Mokashi hmm? with trio? Oh no, I don't have no, that one. Mokashi. But uh, here, uh, cello, cello, piano, and woodwinds. It took me 60 years to convince <laughs> the record company to record this. <laughs> so I first created this in New York with Callow Scott on cello and uh, Bayard Lancaster on, on bass player and piano. And uh, we practiced, practiced, and then we went to the New York Jazz Club and I asked for a gig. I said, I have a trio. And he said, okay. Booking for a week. When we turned up there opening night, they didn't want to pay us. Because they said that's not a trio. A trio is bass, drums, and piano. <laughs> <laughs> Cello. <laughs> so, so it took all those years to, to come with and with uh, Johnny 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 was a uh, he was a herds boy uh, for in the rural areas and he came to Port Elizabeth and then got introduced to the music. So he injected a lot of the of that experience, uh cause our music and the music that he heard as a as a kid, the, the songs of circumcision uh, and the so all, all of us actually started started off with, as vocalists, mm -hmm. started singing, singing the music because we couldn't afford the instrument. And then, you know, <coughs> the, much, 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 uh, not so like the rappers, and then, uh, you know, Johnny got interested in bass. And, uh, I mean, like we, we practiced, mm -hmm. you know, we practiced like 24-7. Now we practice 25, 8. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the big problem there was also was, was the industry. To, because they didn't un either understand or didn't believe or didn't under understand the concept that we had there. Because in South Africa, there was this. Uh, uh, walls that were set up between communities. So the producers uh, in, in the studio, they really didn't understand we were, what we were doing because they didn't understand the language, they didn't understand the culture. So in 1960, 1960, yeah, we recorded the first album. Mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, it was a group of about s seven of us, and we actually said that we are going to play our own, we're going to play our own, our own music. But uh, in some circles, it still was not accepted. So we, uh, we uh, when we left the country because of the, the, the politics, it was it was outside of South Africa that people first began to, to 
to understand it, or to understand it or accept it, and we could at least make a living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to uh, have some time for uh, uh, audience members to ask questions. Um, uh, I hope uh, we have questions. Uh, but let me ask one more. Um, um, I've heard you perform a number of times, and um, a couple of times when I heard you in Northern California, I think this would have been um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, once in San Francisco and once in Santa Cruz, um, you were doing some things that were, you were, they were kind of, they were these short pieces that you kind of sang, kind of recited. Uh, and they were kind of songs and kind of poems. Um, and I've never found them or anything like them on any of your recorded, uh, any, any of your records, your recordings. Uh, and I have a lot of them. And I've been, <laughs> and I've been looking for the, the, those pieces. But they, they were very striking. Um, I mean, you know, my friends and I were all abuzz. What's that he, what's he doing? Um, do you remember? Uh, do you remember that? Uh, and can you say what that was? Were they poems? Were they songs? Um, somebody, well, I guess one of my friends guessed that, you know, that it was some kind of, uh, that one of them was some kind of Irish uh, revolutionary uh, poem chant. Uh, and then someone else said that one of them sounded like something from the PLO. Um, as you can see, we were grasping for straws. <laughs> um, but um, it's been quite a mystery to me, so I'm, I'm happy to actually be able to ask you. Uh, do you recall those, and, and, and what were they, and is there a reason for them, <laughs> is there a reason for them not having been recorded? Uh, everything is recorded anyway. The, the, the our concept is the concept of breath, mm -hmm. uh, the importance of breath. The, and breath, breath connected to memory. Uh, when, a, when, a, when, a, when a child is born, the first breath is in, and then the sound, ah, cry. Right. And this is automatic. When you die, the last breath is also automatic. In your life, the breath is automatic. You're not even aware of it. But we have the possibility to change the rhythm of, of the breath. We are the only creatures who are able to do this. And this is again the principle, the principle of Buddha, of how you apply the breath. So the child, the child is born, and the inhalation and then exhalation of the first cry. There's memory connected with it. Uh, one of our friends in a concert that I just played in, in, in Kyoto, <laughs> after the concert the lady came to the husband, she said, I'm ten months I'm ten months pregnant and the baby heard the music, you know, the baby was really satisfied with it. The, and then this friend of mine, so we were speaking about this and she says his daughter, I think his daughter is now seventeen she actually remembers the sound in the womb. See. So the, our understanding is that breath and memory are totally integral to our existence. The, and this is what music or budo 
whatever the what, whatever it is that we do uh, is how we enhance this breath that we can control. Uh, not just the breath that is that is, that is automatic. To, to my my fiance is a orthopedic pediatric surgeon. So now uh, also doing uh, osteopathy, which, as you know, is is quite a new uh, a new dimension for the hundred and fifty years. Or more. But the principle is that you you use the hands to to feel, and especially with babies. You, know, you feel where there's a where there's a blockage, and then the manipulation of how to how to release that, which is basically Buddha also, which is basically <laughs> play, play play the music. But it, it, uh, They had a, a lady, she was 40, over 40 years of age, came to examination. She had club feet. That's when we were dealing with uh, with uh, uh, orthopedic pediatric that We were dealing with kids with club feet or hip, uh, how to re do adjust this. Uh, this lady, oh, 40 years of age, and she had club feet. And she wanted an operation, but my fiance and the doctor said, but you, it's not possible, you should have had this done when you were younger. But she insisted. And so they prepared theater, and they, they put her under narcosis. When she was under narcosis, the feet went into normal position. So they couldn't operate. <laughs> and when the narcosis wore off, the feet went back into this, uh, into this position. Right? There's a young boy, he was about 14 years of age, they had an operation on his hip. They performed the operation, but they they couldn't uh, understand if the operation was successful or not because they realized then that he does not feel pain. Mm -hmm. And then the parents told us that uh, they realized when he was young that he was ironing, he put his hand on, on the on the iron with with the snow. There was no reaction to it, and it pain. So, in, in our, uh, when we grew up in, in, in South Africa or in Africa, and, and we find that this is the tradition everywhere, is that when we are given this, uh, talent of, of dealing with music, it has got nothing to do with entertainment. <laughs> it, is a, it is a way or, uh, a, or a method that we've been given to, to delve into, into uh, what is regarded as unreality and how we can impart this with it happens with our music. I have, a, I have a song called uh, The Wedding and everywhere we go people come and tell us what how this song has affected them. Where was it? We played a concert in uh, Camden in, in, in London a couple of years ago and when we got there they told us that there's a this man had been waiting there for about four or five, four or five hours to talk to us, and it turned out that he's a, he's a medical doctor. He told us that he deals with, with, with people, young children in comatose, and they tried everything, and then he, he put on his uh, uh, headphones, and they played, he played the wedding, and she came out 
coma. <laughs> we don't we don't know how this happens or <laughs> how this is applied, but perhaps this is our perhaps this is our task. We just draw on into it through jazz music. I was going to ask you about <coughs> some specific pieces of yours, and I was going to ask you some other questions, but um, I would like to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. So do we have a mic that um, could be used by audience members who um, would like to address a question to Mr. Ibrahim? We don't have a mic, but folks can speak up. OK. Anyone? to speak up. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your music and for what you shared with us today. Um, I did want to ask about a specific piece of music, which is um, Manasur. And I wanted to ask, what has it meant to you to play that over the decades and over the kinds of changes um, that have come and that haven't come in South Africa? There are all compositions are about people and events. Um, uh, in West Africa, we are called griots. So, uh, uh, and again, how to impart this information to to young people, the people in our community, because. There's been a severance between this connection between ancient tradition and new relevance. So we have to reestablish this this missing uh, this missing uh, connection. Uh, in Manenberg, uh, there's a one of the we have a series we wrote a song called Krotoa. Now, Krotoa was a, a, a Bushman, Hoi, a young lady. She was about 14 years of age when the settlers from Ribic landed there. And uh, she was uh, the niece of a very one of the very powerful uh, leaders, uh, and uh, she was taken into by the settlers into the into their community, and she was uh, Christianized, and uh, she married. Uh, at that time, was almost unheard of. The, he was the district surgeon, Danish man by the name of Van Mierhof. Of course, this created a lot of tension between the. The, the Hoi and the San people and, and the settlers. Uh, very tragically, and she, she was uh, then exiled to Robben Island. Children were taken away from her. When she came back from Robben Island, back to, to the mainland, she had an alcohol and uh, then died. See, and I wrote this, this song for her. You see, this was mm, early, late 50s, 60s. And I just recorded it, and I, I, I created almost like a, a small suite and about three movements. And the first movement is crystal clear. Dialogue, and it's crystal clear, because crystal clear to us, the timeline and history of what transpired. So crystal clear, the second movement is devotion. That's her devotion to, because she, she actually never turned her back on, on, on the people. Right? Endurance in the last movement is called, I uh, know, uh, devotion. So it's crystal clear devotion and the last movement is called endurance concept of enduring. So 
We'd been playing this music, especially in, in, in the township. It was never recorded because uh, it was regarded as a decadent. And uh, so I, <laughs> I don't try with, with musicians because when we, st when we started really checking out the music, you see, we realize the complexity of it. I mean, the co complexity of, of, of traditional music, maybe <laughs> the jazz is like a plaything. You know? I took some of my musicians, Akaya musicians, I took them to South Africa a few years ago and uh, introduced them to these uh, traditional groups of uh, about 20 of these groups. They were totally blown away. And this was, the music and traditions were always family. So these were family members, and my, my drummer was sitting there, and that old lady was almost 90 years of age. What is it? Five, seven, is it nine? What is it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and also the, 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 inter, the intonation. So this complexity that, uh, and I think this is one of the, one of the problems that we, that we, that we, we, we experience. I don't realize why is it that from India there are so many people who excel in high tech. Yeah. And my understanding is that it is basically when you look at the complexity of the music, of Indian music, you know. So at an early age you are exposed to this complexity in uh, And this is another reason why we chose, chose this farm, go into, into the desert, because you deal with formless form. Yeah, we're sitting in this uh, building here, it's 4-4. Four, four. So the music that we're accustomed to is all in 4-4. Four, four. <laughs> Uh, so with Mannenberg, this was a tradition that we've been playing in the townships, and, but nobody wanted to record. Nobody wanted to record it. So we were recording in, in Cape Town. I wrote about five other, five other songs we were practicing and recording this, and then there was a break, and I, I was. Uh, yeah, I was playing on a grand piano, and the corner was a, was a, a small uh, upright piano. And I touched the piano, and the first one, da da di da da, that was a very strange sound, this upright piano, because what they used to do, they put d drawing pins or tacks on, on the hammers. And so when the hammer hits the string, it has this, uh, this uh, metallic sound. And uh, the horn players, we were just, uh, it was just a little thing that we picked up. And we asked the engineer, okay, uh, roll it. And we, we recorded it for 17 minutes. And we went back <laughs> to record the other stuff, you see. But then we said, no, oh, wait a minute, let, let, us, let, us, let us play back here. And we realized that we had. It was totally unrehearsed. You know. It was just that one take where everything came together. The, the drummer, the rhythm that he played was basically the tradition that the bass player, the horn players, the, and the, the idea was to, to, to play in the context of our experience and not, not play jazz solos. Uh, it was at the time, at the height of the, the Soweto uprising, uh, people were arrested, people were being shot down. Uh, and uh, so we dedicated this song to one of the townships in, in, in Cape Town, where this brutality was, was happening at the moment. It was called Manenberg. So we took it to all the record companies, nobody wanted it. 
We have a, a little record shop in Johannesburg at the bus terminus. Where all the buses come in from from Township. We have a little record shop there, and we we made some acetates, we made some copies, and uh, we played it over the, the loudspeakers, and we sold we sold forty thousand CDs and two if we can make it. You know. And, but what, what we, we realized afterwards, we had captured the, the, the spirit and the sound of the people, people at that time. And then it became uh, the unofficial uh, national anthem of the, of the liberation. So we still have to play it. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, one more question. And I think we're out of time. Yes. Another piece of music. Um, you have a piece, and you sing on occasion. A piece from John Coltrane. You talked about uh, monks' music. What, what is Coltrane's music and his life meant to you? And how is it connected to the spirit of your? Oh, we were so blessed. We were all in New York at that time. Uh, Coltrane, a uh, monk. Uh, <laughs> quite an experience being with his people. They were all, and we all, you know, all the stories, all the jazz stories, you know, these <laughs> musicians. Uh, Coltrane, and we, at that time, I was playing saxophone. I, 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 I tried to play saxophone, but when I and we saw how Train was practicing. <laughs> I mean, the, what he had tried to do was, um, and if I'm a, you know the story, what they call sheets of sound. If I'm a piano player, if I strike, strike a chord, I can play 10 notes at the same time. What he tried to do was play those 10 notes as a chord at the same time. So, and uh, that's when, when, he, when he met Alice Coltrane. I think that was uh, the defining moment for him because she was a harp, harper. So when he saw the harp pigeons, <laughs> he, he, tried, he tried to play that at breakneck speed. Uh, but uh, Coltrane, like, like Ornette and Don Cherry and Sir Hotel, they didn't say that. It took us a it just confirmed what, what we had been hearing. Um, your monk says, uh, uh, piano ain't got no wrong notes. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, and, uh, and train, what, what train actually did was also to, to make us to make us understand that there are no confines in in, in concept of time. Remember, uh, Miles told us that uh, when train went to play, play with him, he would play in a club. You know the story. And, uh, when train took a solo, Miles said he, he went to the bar. And I got drink. The train went on and on and on and <laughs> on. <laughs> but it was incredible because every every next quarter the energy level would rise up. It's quite intense. Um, Miles said to he said to the train, hey John, why don't you play shorter choruses? And train said, no. Nah, now the music is so beautiful, I get carried away, I can't stop. And Miles says, have you tried taking the horn out of your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you know the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Train. You want to tell the Toots Thielman story? Um, Do you want to tell the Toots Thielman story? The Toots Thielman story? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, perhaps, perhaps uh, not to steal as a uh, monk. Well, you know, we, we come to New York City, we're all out of work 20 years, monk, no work for 20 years, Ellington, so you know, to pay our dues. <laughs> so, so, monk also, 20 years, you know, no work, and then finally gets this big, big break. Uh, Time magazine. Did you see that clip from mm. the movie? Mm. I'm famous, ain't that a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he gets a recording session and with all the musicians in the studio. And uh, but Monk doesn't pitch. So they wait the whole day for Monk, Monk doesn't turn up. So they have to cancel the recording session. And the next day, Jules Columbia, his manager, met Monk. He said, Monk, what happened yesterday? And Monk said, why? He said, well, it was the recording, you know. Everybody was here waiting for you. And Monk said, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Jazz musicians. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've gone past one o'clock, and I, we should wrap this up. But thank you very much for your thank your you generosity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.